Good day to you, my dear friends. Good midweek to you. We gently place a wedge in the middle of the week, inviting us to just separate, like the waters in the Red Sea separated so that the Israelites moving from slavery to freedom could walk on dry ground. God is the ground of your being. We recall that now as we get in touch with our being, with our body, with our breathing, with our heart beating. So gently rest in the quiet of this midday <clears throat> as you get in touch with your breathing. Gently, nice deep breath. <sighs> Exhale. That's a good sigh. Sometimes our sighing expresses a relief, a discharge of what could be pent up within us. So have a good sigh. Rest in the center of this week, in the center of your day. Lord God, I offer you this time with our dear friends that come together to listen and to pray and to take a look at a psalm, one a week, as we go through the week's 156 Wednesdays, and we take a long, when we get to Psalm 119, we'll take six weeks for that. But one a week, and gently we will move through this three-year cycle in the Bible through the seasons, which we pray will give you blessed peace. <clears throat> and now, some silence. Feel your breathing. Feel gravity holding your body to the chair or the floor or the bed, supporting you. The gravity of what keeps us on the ground. The gravity of what we do when we pray. There's gravity in it. There's a sense of weightiness. In fact, the Hebrew word for glory is kabod, which means weighty. So this is a time to give God glory. I'm going to pause now for some moments of silence that we pray will ennoble us for about a half a minute. There's a beauty in silence, and I hope you're aware, as I am, of the beauty of a shared silence. When we're in silence together, as the Quaker movement expresses, they gather together to be in the silence together as though they're sweeping as a group, the space apart so that the spirit can speak. I'm going to go back now to what I uh, shared in this Bible of the Seasons for Families, wrote it about 2011. And so some of the images that occurred to me then, I just recast them, recast them at this point. It's Psalm 35, and this is the fire starter. It's entitled Sparks for a New Fire. The campfire is almost out. Only a few lonely sparks click in the night. This is how the writer of Psalm 35 feels. The spark in his life is just about out because of all the mean things that his enemies are planning for him. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, as the hymn Pass It On sings. 
Hopefully you feel the fire of your life blazing as strong as the psalm writer. But even if you feel sad and afraid, there are sparks from the Spirit in your heart. Just like the Holy Spirit, just let the Holy Spirit blow on them and the fire will become warm and bright. The Bible breaths for today and every day are perfect for the breaths of the Spirit. May you feel God's faithful love and protection of you. I'll come back later to what I reference in that final line of the fire starter about Bible breaths. I have a couple of samples for you toward the end, but let's first just go to this beautiful psalm. It says a psalm of David. Now, most scripture writers don't figure that David wrote this as such, because David goes back about one millennium before Christ. So we don't know. We know that he had a tradition of singing. He was a musician. He sang and he speaks about uh, musical instruments. That's really what the, the word psalm means. It comes from the Greek word, which stands for musical instruments and sounds of music. So what I think, rather than disqualify David as the author, whoever did write this psalm, maybe four or 500 years later. They're all not quite sure. The book of Psalms stretches over many centuries in its composition, so it's really hard to tell, and that's okay. We don't have to get firm answers about that. But whoever wrote this, whatever he was experiencing, and it sounds very personal, he got in touch with David, who clearly was having a rough time with Saul, the jealous king that went before him, which we read about in the first books of Samuel. So when we read this psalm, and the psalmist who wrote it, we embody the feeling of David. So let's take you. When I hear, when I read this psalm, uh, when I read the first person pronoun me, let that be you. I'm going to Read it on your behalf, as it were. I'm going to let the words of the psalm speak to you. So we embrace this gorgeous psalm and we situate it as a prayer. Many of the psalms are complaints about enemies, as this one will be. But they're in the context of prayer. They're not meant to be complaints as a victim, even though he's being victimized. He doesn't speak what one lady in a group that, that Gina and I ran, she doesn't speak victimese, which is, poor me, look at the way I'm being treated, with no real reference to prayer. Once you take whatever is coming against you and you place it in the form of a prayer, you automatically shield yourself from the negative aspects of that. And it's just like what they say in Spanish, a desaugo. We use the phrase unburdening yourself. I like the Spanish phrase desaugo. It means to algar means to drown. To desaugar means to undrown yourself. So may this psalm undrown yourself from whatever might be coming against you. Contend, Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and armor. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to me, I am your salvation. May those who seek my life be disgraced and be put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back in dismay. May they be like chaff before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. 
May their path be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Since they hid their net for me without cause and without cause dug a pit for me, may ruin overtake them by surprise. May the net they hid entangle them. May they fall into the pit to their ruin. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in his salvation. My whole being will exclaim, who is like you, Lord? You rescue the poor from those too strong for them, the poor and needy from those who rob them. Ruthless witnesses come forward. They question me on things I know nothing about. They repay me evil for good and leave me like one bereaved. Yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. When my prayers returned to me unanswered, I went about mourning as though my friend or brother. I bowed my head in grief as though weeping for my mother. But when I stumbled, they gathered in glee. Assailants gathered against me without my knowledge. They slandered me without ceasing. Like the ungodly, they maliciously mocked. They gnashed their teeth at me. How long, Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their ravages, my precious life from these lions. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. Among the throngs, I will praise you. Do not let those gloat over me who are my enemies without cause. Do not let those who hate me without reason maliciously wink the eye. They do not speak peaceably but devise false accusations against those who live quietly in the land. They sneer at me and say, aha, aha, with our own eyes, we have seen it. Lord, you have seen this. Do not be silent. Do not be far from me, Lord. Awake and rise to my defense. Contend for me, my God and Lord. Vindicate me in your righteousness, Lord my God. Do not let them gloat over me. Do not let them think, aha, just what we wanted, or say, we have swallowed him up. May all who gloat over my distress be put to shame and confusion. May all who exalt themselves over me be clothed with shame and disgrace. May those who delight in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May they always say, the Lord be exalted, who delights in the well-being of his servant. My tongue will proclaim your righteousness, your praises all day long. So there it is, dear friends. And something that I learned in preparing for this, uh, for this reading, the first verse of this psalm was the first prayer in the American Congress on May the 5th, 1774. Let me read that first verse again. Contend, Lord with those who contend with me, fight against those who fight against me. So this is two years before the Declaration of Independence. And so the opening of this psalm, the opening prayer of that Congress was aware of those that are contending, the British and all of the injustices that accompanied their reign here in the colonies, they were contending. So I don't know how much the rest of that psalm or the spirit of that psalm continued in the course of the deliberations, but it's interesting that the first person that said that was, contend, Lord, with those who contend with me, 
fight against those who fight against me. It's as though that all of the contention is in God's hands. Yes, there was an American Revolution which needed to take place, but the contention of that prayer and the deliberations were poised in such a way that it would be them that are expressing it. I'm going to go a little bit beyond the 15 minutes because I do want to say something about Bible breaths. Um, on other occasions, you heard me perhaps talk about these seven-syllable breath prayers. So I'm going to close my time with you this morning by just giving you four samples from this psalm of how you can distill the essence of this psalm in another prayer form, a, breath, a breath prayer, or as I'm calling them, uh, Bible breaths. From verse 3, you are my salvation, Lord. From verse 10, all my bones say, you are Lord. From verse 22, O Lord, be not far from me. All day long, from verse 28, all day long, my tongue in praise. So let one or other of these get in with your breathing as you take many pauses in the course of the day. Let your breathing be prayer. God bless you.